So there in the 12th chapter of Matthew's gospel, when we take a look at that 36 and that 37 verse there, we'll see that Jesus, that, that he was speaking with authority and he was speaking with authority over who would or would not be justified on the day of judgment. And so there in the 38th verse, when the religious leaders, when they heard what it was that Jesus had said, we're told there in that scripture that they came to him and they said to him, teacher, teacher, we want to see a sign. We want to see a sign from you. How many of us are asking God today, give me a sign? How many of us today are asking God, show me a sign today? In other words, the religious leaders, they wanted for Jesus to prove himself. They wanted Jesus to prove who he was because again, he had been speaking with authority over something that they believe only belonged to God. And so they said to Jesus, prove who you are by performing a miracle right here, right now for us. Yeah, how many of us are saying to God today, give me a sign, do this for me and I will believe in you. How many of us are saying to God today, prove yourself to me. Now, what's very interesting about this is that these are these religious leaders, they asked this of Jesus after some of them had just seen Jesus cast out demons. We'll see that there in the 22nd verse. In the 13th and the 14th verse, we'll see that others that they had been present when Jesus had healed the man with the withered hand. We just looked at that in the Sunday school lesson recently, didn't we? I tell you that by this point in time in Matthew's gospel, it is documented at least 14 times that Jesus had performed miracles. And in many other miracles, Jesus, he had healed multitudes of people. And, and what's very fascinating about it is that in those documented occasions, those same religious leaders, they happened to be present. They were always around Jesus. But yet here in this moment, they say to Jesus, show us a sign, prove who you are to us. So did Jesus, did he need to show them a sign? Did Jesus, did he need to prove himself to them? Y'all said no. Jesus, he said there in the 39th verse, there again in my key verse for today, he said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And he said to them, no sign will be given to it, that evil and adulterous generation, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So y'all said, no, he didn't need to prove himself. No, he didn't need to do a miracle for them. And we see here that Jesus said the same thing. And Jesus, he refused to give them the sign that they wanted. Now think about that for a moment. Let's think about this for a moment. Because again, I believe that some of us today, we are asking for God to give us a sign, aren't we? But Jesus, he refused to give them a sign. And if you think about it for a moment, what good would a sign, what good would a miracle, what good would it do them if they had not believed in all of the miracles that he had already did for them? Now, though he didn't perform a miracle for them right then and there in that moment, in my key verse, we'll see that Jesus, that he pointed to a future sign, which he said was the sign of Jonah. So some of us, we may begin to wonder, well, what is the sign of Jonah? Jesus, he explained for us there in the 40th verse 
that the sign of Jonah was Jonah's being in the belly of a great fish three days and three nights. And he said there that as Jonah was in the belly of that great fish for three days and three nights, he said that the son of man that is talking about himself, he said that the son of man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. For all of us who are looking for a sign from God, I want you to understand today that the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, that stands as a sign from the Lord. Do you hear me here today? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, that is proof of God. You see, the resurrection of Christ that proved that Jesus, that he was truly the only begotten son of God. Only he rose from the dead unto everlasting life, unto glory. The resurrection of Christ that serves as both a sign and a seal of God's promise of salvation to us. It is proof that if we believe in the only begotten son, we will not perish, but we will have everlasting life. Again, Jesus, he is a sign. He is proof as being the firstborn of the resurrection unto everlasting life. And so again, if we believe in him, we will rise the same way that he did. We will not rise as Lazarus did. You see, yes, Lazarus, he was risen from the dead, but he was risen to die again. He was risen to have headaches again. He was risen to suffer again. I, I don't know about you, but when I leave this world physically, I don't want to rise again so that I can have kidney failure again. So that I can suffer from, from headaches again so that I could catch the flu again, so that I could go through all of the mess that we go through today. When I rise again, I want to rise unto everlasting life. And, and I want you to understand today that God has given me proof that it will happen. And he gave me that proof through his only begotten son. Now, something that sticks with me there from my key verse today, in this response from Jesus to the religious leaders, was his statement about that generation. And Jesus, he said to the religious leaders, he said to them that they were of an evil and an adulterous generation. Does my, is my Bible the only one that says that? Do y'all see the same thing in your Bible? Yes. So that, that, I don't know how that makes y'all feel, but it sticks with me. And, and the reason why that statement there, the reason why it sticks with me is because I think of this generation. I think about this generation that all of us are a part of. I'm not just talking about millennials. I'm not just talking about Gen X. I'm not talking about just Gen Z or, or baby boomers here. I'm talking about this generation. All of us who are in the world today, that's who's on my mind. This is a generation that has been given the sign of God. Yet many of us, we are still looking up to the heavens and, and we're praying and saying, God, give me a sign. If you do this for me, Lord, I'll believe in you. We get sick and some will say, Lord, if you, if you just heal me, I, I'll go to church. When we start going through our trials and, and our tribulations, and they become so much for us to bear, we say to God, Lord, if you, if you, if you bring me through this storm, man, I, I'll never stop believing in you. If we say that, I don't want y'all about that word if. 
Avenue. You see, many are looking for a sign from God that proves that, that he is there. Many are looking for a sign from God today to prove that he is real. I tell you today, God is real. Many are looking for a sign from, from God because they want to believe, while others, they look with doubt in their hearts. They don't want to believe. There are others looking to the heavens for a sign from God because they are lost and they are in need of help. And so a question that I would ask today, well, is this, is it right or wrong for us to be looking for a sign from the Lord? Is it right or is it wrong for us to be looking for a sign from God? I tell you today that when one truly desires in their heart for the Lord to reveal himself to them, I tell you today that God will do it. If you truly desire for the Lord to reveal himself to you, I tell you today that God, he will reveal himself to you. Now, some of us, we may begin to wonder, well, I haven't seen God before. That's what some of us are saying. Some of us will say, well, pastor, how will he do it? How does he reveal himself to us? Well, over in the 16th chapter of John's gospel and the 13th verse, if you want to turn there and look at it for yourself, you'll see in that scripture that Jesus, that he pointed to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, he said in that scripture, he said that he, the spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth and glorify the Lord. He will reveal the Lord to you. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said there. Now, in his letter, in his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul, he wrote to them in the second chapter and the 12th verse, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. God, I want you to understand today, God, he does not hide himself from us. He will freely reveal himself to us today if we truly desire to see him. So let's be very clear about this. What you understand today that the Lord, he is revealed through the Holy Spirit. God, he reveals himself to us through the Holy Spirit. But in order for you to see the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit must reside. The Holy Spirit must abide with you. And the only way that the Holy Spirit will abide with you is if you are in fellowship with God, if you are in fellowship with the Lord. And those that are in fellowship with the Lord today are those that believe. And, and to be more specific about that, those who sincerely, those who genuinely believe in the Lord, they are those who receive the spirit of promise. Do you believe in God today? Mm -hmm. You see, if you do not believe, you have not received the Holy Spirit. And if you have not received the Holy Spirit, I tell you today, it's going to be hard for you to see the signs of the Lord. It's going to be hard for you to, to recognize the proofs of God. You will be unable to do it. You will not see God. You will not perceive him. If you, the Holy Spirit, if it ain't with you, if he does not reside with you today. Now, there are many today that are like the religious leaders. They think that they're old a sign of proof from God. They, they believe that God should, that he must. They don't think that they need to do anything special to be able to see proof of the Lord. They believe that they are owed a sign from God. How many of us think in that way today? Who are we to think that God needs to prove himself to us?
I ask you today, does not the potter, does not the potter have power over the clay? God is the last I checked. God is the potter. And, and, and we are the clay. And, and, and what I mean by that is that, that the Lord, he is sovereign. He's over all things. He is almighty. He's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. The last time I checked, God, he don't need to prove himself to me. Who am I? to look to God and demand that God prove himself to me. You see, the religious leaders, they approached Jesus like they had the final authority over him. They approached him like they had the say over whether or not he truly was the only begotten son of God. But they faced a, a major problem there. The problem that they face is that they continue to overlook the signs that were actually given to them by God. They weren't able to perceive that God was standing right there before them. Over in the fifth chapter of John's gospel, beginning at the 31st verse and going down to the 39th verse, Jesus, he shared with these same folks. He shared with them his witnesses that proved who exactly he was as the only begotten son of God. In that scripture, Jesus, he said that his witnesses who testified of who he was were the scriptures. Was John the Baptist? was the works that he did, and then the Father in heaven. Jesus had a fourfold witness who he said stood as proof that he was the only begotten son of God, but the religious leaders, they denied his witness. The religious leaders, they didn't believe him. And, and think about what that means for a moment here. They call Jesus a liar. One that, that when he did do works, that he did it by the king of demons. Think about what this means here for a moment today. They call Jesus a liar. They call the works that he did a lie. They called John the Baptist a lie. They killed him, in fact. Not only did they call those things a lie, but then they turned around and they was calling the scriptures a lie as well. They didn't believe the scriptures. They didn't believe the word of God. And then on top of that, they was calling the Father in heaven a lie. Oh, uh-oh. Oh, oh, boy. How many of us today are saying that God needs to prove himself to us? Are saying today that I need a sign from God before I believe? Do you realize today that you're calling the scriptures a lie? Some do. Some don't mind calling the scriptures a lie. Do you realize that you're calling the Father a lie when you deny Christ? You see, the proof provided by God, it wasn't good enough for the religious leaders. You see, the religious leaders, they were stubborn, weren't they? They were stubborn and in their hearts and that stubbornness, it, it caused them to, to go blind to Christ. And Jesus, he said, whoever denies me before me and him, I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. Are you denying Christ today? And as I said in the Sunday school lesson this morning, if you think that you can get to heaven, that you can get to the gates and have denied Christ in this world, and that you can say there at those gates, hey, I belong in the kingdom of heaven, you better think again. You can't deny Christ down here and think that you'll have a heavenly home. You see, something that I want all of you to understand today 
is that God, he has already proven himself to us. All of you who are out there today saying, God, give me a sign and I will believe if you prove yourself to me, I want you to understand today that God, he has already proven himself to us by his only begotten son. And if you need more proof today, I would tell you that the Lord, he still continues to prove himself today in many ways, in many ways. God, he still gives us a sign. He may not give you the sign that you want, but he still gives us signs today. And some may say, well, what signs are you talking about, pastor? How, what, what kind of signs is it that he gives to us? I would tell you today that if you're looking for a sign from God today, I would tell you to take a moment to look at us. Look at us observe life itself. You see, life is a miracle. How many of us have forgotten that birth itself? That birth itself, life again is a miracle. When, when we, when we are again, that seed in, in the mother's womb, when it is, when it fertilizes that egg, that's a miracle. There are many who go barren today. Sarah thought that she was barren, but when she had that child, she saw it as a miracle. She understood that again, just conceiving a child in a womb, that is a miracle. But we take that for granted today, don't we? Talking about God need to prove himself to us. And then when the baby leaves the mother's womb and is able to take that first grab, that first gasp of air, there's applause and celebration. Do you know why? Because it's a miracle that that baby did that. But many of us, we take that for granted, don't we? We're living in a world where we have breathable air that we don't even think anything of today. We, we live in a world that is surrounded by, by atmosphere that seals in that breathable air. We live in a world with that same atmosphere that shields and it protects us from, from space and, and radiation. It protects us from the sun. Somebody go say, oh, pastor's starting to get sciency now. But we take it all for granted. Here we are in the world today where on this rock we have water. And, and it rains on, on this rock that, that, replenishes, that replenishes that water. And that water, it, it supplies life to the plants, right? To vegetation, which kicks off the food chain, which we are on top of. That's what we like to say, don't we? It sustains life. Well, again, we take all of that for granted, don't we? Talking about God needs to prove himself, but he continues to bless us day by day with a life that is a miracle. The fact that I would look at us and I'll see how much we try to destroy each other. And yet we haven't did it yet. No matter how hard we try to destroy each other, I would say that that's a miracle as well. And, and, and I would point to God's intervention over us because if God was not real, as some would like to think, mankind would have destroyed itself thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. But here we are today. Thanks be to God. I don't get no amens on that one, do I? God, he's still in control, isn't he? So no more proof is needed. Yet we still question God. Yet we still are looking up to the heavens saying, God, give me a sign. Prove yourself to me and I will believe. I ask you today, are we an evil and an adulterous generation? Are we an evil and an adulterous generation is what I ask you today. So what was it that made the religious leaders, what made them a part of an evil and an adulterous generation? Throughout scripture, God's relationship with Israel is likened to a marriage. 
For example, over in the, the book of Isaiah, if you will turn with me over to the book of Isaiah and take a look at the 54th chapter, and you can hold there in the book of Isaiah here for a moment today. In the 54th chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah, if we take a look at the fifth verse, we'll see that it was said to Israel, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Again, throughout scripture, this is the picture of God's relationship with the children of Israel, with Israel as that as a marriage. Now, as we know, marriage, it requires a few things, doesn't it? Marriage, the last time I checked, it requires faith, doesn't it? It requires, I hope, love, doesn't it? Marriage, it requires trust, right? Now, one who commits adultery is one who has chosen not to be faithful. They have chosen to be unfaithful. Now, God, we should know, God is full of faithfulness. God, as scripture says, and as he has proven, God is love. God is full of trust. And so the Lord, he, as he promised, would never leave us. He would never forsake us. God, he would never cheat on us. God is not one to commit adultery in marriage. So when Jesus spoke of that generation having cheated on the Lord and, 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 and uh, moving against him, Jesus was saying that they were as an unfaithful bride. Now, some of us, we may begin to wonder, well, how were they unfaithful? Turn over to the next chapter in Isaiah for me. Take a look at the 55th chapter of Isaiah. And there in the 55th chapter of Isaiah, we'll see that God, he sent to Israel another invitation. And the reason why I say another invitation, because way back in the book of Exodus, in the 19th chapter of Exodus, we see where God, he sent the he first invitation to them, where he desired to make a covenant with them, and they agreed to the covenant. But when we get all the way back, all the way over to, to Isaiah, and, and we know that they were living disobediently. We know that they cheated on God. We know that they were being unfaithful. And so we'll see there in the first verse there that God, he sent another invitation to Israel to where God, he invited all who thirst to come to him. Those that had no money to come, he invited them to come as well and to eat without money and without price free of charge, come to me. God, he said to Israel there in the second and the third verse, he said to them in this invitation, incline your ear and come to me, he said there. Here, and he said, you shall live and I'll make an everlasting covenant with you. Now, when we look at that, those verses there, again, God invited Israel to let their soul delight in abundance. Whether they had money or not, they were invited to come eat by wine and milk free of charge without price. I don't know about y'all, but this sounds like a wonderful invitation to me. That, that God, you know, God invited, if, if God was to invite me free of charge to come and be with him, I'm spreading to go and be with God. I don't know about y'all, but, but I'm trying to get there as fast as possible. Look at that sixth verse there. In the sixth verse, they said to Israel that if they desired to have abundant life, all they needed to do was call upon his name. All they needed to do was call upon the Lord. Then there in the seventh verse, we're told there that, again, all they needed to do was forsake the way of wickedness and, again, return to him. That's all they needed to do to enjoy abundant life with the Lord. But sadly, Israel, they rejected that invite. They forsook God, didn't they? 
They're looking for idols, for the bells, for the asterisks, as, as Old Testament scripture shows us. Then, by the time of Jesus, the religious leaders, these ones who are interacting with him, as we see here in our scripture today, over in 12th chapter Matthew's gospel, these religious leaders, they were obsessed with power and authority. They, they were living with a, a, a worldly mindset, not one that was a spiritual mindset. Jesus, at one point in time in the scripture, over in the 21st chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 13th verse, when he went to the house of prayer, he saw how corrupt those people, how corrupt they had become. He said to them, y'all have turned the house of prayer, my house, y'all have turned it into a den of thieves. An evil and adulterous generation, he said in my key verse for today. Then I ask you today, I ask all of you today, are we part of an evil and an adulterous generation? Are we part of an evil and adulterous generation? What says you? You see, we have many again today, just like the religious leaders, they are again looking to the heavens and they are asking for the Lord to give them a sign. They are asking for the Lord to prove exactly who he was. And so when I look at this generation, I believe that we must consider today our faithfulness. We must consider our faithfulness and how we have treated the invitation that we have received from the Lord. Now, some of us, we're going to look around and say, well, what invitation have, have I received from God? What invitation has God sent to us? Well, didn't he give us his only begotten son? And we said his only begotten son today stands as that sign, stands as that proof, right? Well, if you're unaware, we have received an invitation from the Lord to join him. Paul, he wrote over in the 11th chapter of Romans and the 11th verse, he wrote that through Israel's fall, through their neglecting of the covenant, the neglecting of Christ, the neglecting of the promise of salvation, Paul said that salvation has come to the world. It, it has come to everyone through, again, Christ. Mm -hmm. How have we treated that invitation? Have we welcomed it with open arms or have we pushed it away from us? How have you received the invitation from the Lord today? And I tell you that I am greatly concerned about this generation. I am greatly concerned about this generation because there are many similarities from, from our generation, this generation, to the generation that we have been taking a look at in scripture today, to those evil and those adulterous generations that we see throughout scripture. Again, there in the 55th chapter of Isaiah in the second verse, the Lord, he once asked Israel, he wants to ask them, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? That's a question that I believe it, it can be asked of this generation today. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy the soul? See, one of the most disturbing things about this generation is how we are so obsessed over things that does nothing for us in our soul. It, it to me, it is truly one of the most disturbing things about this day and age. We sing about how we'd rather have Jesus than, than silver and gold. I'm sorry, Kurt Franklin, but how much of that is true? See, silver and gold is all the things we chase after today. And, and I began to wonder, with our being so obsessed over silver and gold, what has it done for us? From, from, from my point of view, 
All I see is hardships. Endless telemarketing calls. You can't go nowhere and, and, and get anything off a dollar, man. You, you used to be able to do it about a decade or so ago, but they done got rid of that. Those fast food places, they charge more than, than the restaurants that you can go and sit in and eat now. Don't get me started on the gas prices. Silver and gold. Generations before us, they had a better sense of community. And I feel today, though we live next to each other, we, we couldn't be any further apart from each other. And I'm looking at us now. Y'all know what I mean when I say us. Our hunger for silver and gold has not only caused us as a community to, to drift apart, but we as a community, we have drifted further and further away from the Lord when we used to stand right next to him, when we used to lean on him, when we used to sing out, when we used to cry out for him, we don't do it today. We cry out for that silver and gold, don't we? And Jesus, he said, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your heart at today? Many, again, are wanting to see a sign from God, but... Again, I tell you today that they will never see it because their eyes are looking in the wrong place. Like the children of Israel, many can't see the signs of God because their sights, they aren't focused on heaven. They're too busy focused on being down here. Because their sights are on the world, they continue down a path of wickedness. And I tell you today that if you think that you can see God in wickedness, you're looking in the wrong place because God ain't there. Last time I checked, God, he is where holiness is. God is where righteousness is. So your sights should be set on where holiness and where righteousness is. Your sights should be set on heaven if you want to see proof of the Lord. Oh, boy. We are an evil and adulterous generation that cheats on God. We cheat on God today for the sake of silver and gold. We cheat on God today for the sake of the world and its riches. As Israel forsook God for idols, this generation, it does the same thing. We are forsaking gods for idols today. We're worshiping calves of gold today in the world. Idolatry, it runs rapid today. Apostasy, it runs rapid today. Many are participating in the idol worship of celebrity. Many are participating in the idol worship of politics, politicians, presidential candidates. Oh boy, they ain't gonna, they ain't gonna hear that. But it is what it is, I'm gonna keep it real. We are participating in the idol worship of, of wealth. And again, I ask today, what is it going to do for you? Is it doing something for your soul today? Is it, is it going to bring your soul back from the dead unto everlasting life in the kingdom of God? You better think again if you think it will. Gaining billions won't do anything to get you into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, boy. Silver and gold won't do anything to get you into the kingdom of heaven. Those celebrities, those politicians that you're, you're, you're idling around, that you're worshiping today, that you're praising today, they ain't getting you there. Those that are building themselves up like they guys when they ain't nothing but liars and frauds, they ain't getting you there as well. As I have gotten older, I have begun to realize just how much we have cheated ourselves out of life because of silver and gold, because of a foolish mindset. I don't believe we have realized just how much we have missed out on in life and then in the beauty of life and the beauty of this world that the Lord has put us in. We have cheated ourselves out on it. 
because we have cheated on God for silver and gold again, we miss out on so much. We miss out on family. We miss out on love. We miss out on grace. We miss out on blessings because of silver and gold. So I tell you today that we have not only become an evil and an adulterous generation, we are quickly becoming a lost generation. A generation that has lost its sights on the Lord. A generation that will be lost from God if we don't turn around. Oh boy. The religious leaders, they were looking for a sign. Jesus' message to those religious leaders was for them to stop being blind to the obvious and for them to open up their eyes. God was standing right there before them. I tell you today that if you're looking for a sign from God, if you're looking for a sign from heaven today, Jesus, he will share the same message with you today. Stop being blind to the obvious. I'm right here standing before you. And then he would ask them, why can't you see me? You say, Andrew sees me. Deanna sees me. Why can't you see me? And I tell you today that God, he has not hid himself from, it, from us. He's not hid himself from, from anyone. He is there. He is present. All you have to do is have faith and receive the Holy Spirit who will guide you to him. And looking at the 12th chapter there, as I begin to come to a close here, we'll see that to the religious leaders, Jesus, he pointed to those who were of Nineveh there in the scripture. Those who are of Nineveh, those were, those were who Jonah had ministered to after being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Jesus, he said there in the 41st verse, he said to the religious leaders, he said, the men of Nineveh, they will rise up in this generation, with this generation, in judgment. And he said that those of Nineveh, they will condemn this evil and adulterous generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now, this, this says a lot about the religious leaders and a lot about that generation. You see, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyrians. The, the Assyrians, they were people that Jonah, he didn't want to minister to because the Assyrians, they came in, and they wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel. They conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. That's why Jonah ran away and ended up in the belly of the fish in the first place. You see, those Assyrians, they, they were Gentiles. And being Gentiles, they worshiped idols. You know, we would have called them pagans and, and we would have called them heathens. And many people wouldn't have anything to do with them today. But Jonah, he went and he shared the word with them. And Jesus said that they will rise up and they will condemn that evil and adulterous generation. And the reason why is because they opened up their eyes. Those who are pagans and those who are heathens. They opened up their eyes and they repented. They turned to the Lord. If they can do it, why haven't we done it? There in the 42nd verse, Jesus, he then pointed to the queen of the South. The queen of the South, that's a reference to the queen of Sheba. This was the queen that had heard the fame of Solomon, had heard all about what Solomon's God had done for him, how blessed he was, but she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe what it was that she was hearing about this. And so she left home to go to see it for herself. And when she arrived, she had many questions for Solomon. You see, the queen, she was like those who are of Nineveh. She was a Gentile woman. She likely worshiped her idols as well. But when Solomon began to teach her, and her eyes began to open and she began to learn the queen. She said to Solomon, blessed be the Lord, your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel. Her eyes were open to the blessings of God and she wanted in. So what did she do? She repented. She turned to God. If her eyes were open to God, 
Why haven't your eyes been opened to God? And we have the sign of God. We have received Christ. I tell you today that there is nothing wrong with asking questions when one truly desires to learn. Again, Jesus, he has said to us, and we know it very well. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks will find, and, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. You see, God, he wants to reveal himself to you. But do you truly want to see him today? If you truly want to see him today, I tell you to train your sights, train your hearts in the right direction. And God, he will be there. The Holy Spirit, again, will guide you to him. The Holy Spirit will guide you to the Son. I tell you today that God, he is still at work to be seen. His works, they can be seen. Again, if you receive the Holy Spirit, they will be revealed to you. You see, I tell you today that I stand before you as one of those signs of the Lord. I am a blessing of the Lord. I am a miracle. I shouldn't be here today, but I am here today. Not by my own strength, not by my own power, not by my own might, but because of God. You today, you are a sign of God. You have gone through your storms. You have gone through your trials. You have gone through your tribulations, not by your strength, not by your own power, not by your own might, but because God intervened. We, again, we are testimonies of the Lord today. So if you're looking for a sign from God today, you feel like you need proof, I tell you today, open up your eyes to the obvious. God, he is very near. God's signs, they leave no doubt. They are very clear. They can convince the most wicked to turn to him. All the most wicked need to do is open up their eyes and they will see him. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications, so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.